All right, so let's get this thing started. Welcome to the knowns and unknowns of myopia management and other cool stuff in optometry, which is brought to you by the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control and GP Specialist. GP Specialist is 100% dedicated to OrthoK and has one of the largest portfolios of OrthoK lenses. We thank them for their support. And I'd also like to say thank you to Contamac for underwriting a portion of today's program. Optimum is one of the most popular lens materials in the market. All right, before we get started, I want to add that the opinions and viewpoints expressed tonight do not reflect the AAOMC or its sponsors of the program. And uh, this is uh, episode three of our ongoing six-part series, and we have two sections for tonight's episode. Our first section is a panel discussion, what do I need and what does it cost, starting a myopia management practice. And then after that, we'll kick it over to our clinical corner, which is what is good information for OrthoK, expert tips on how to measure. All right, so for our first two panelists, we'll activate video and turn on audio. Then we'll go ahead and start with our introductions. All right, let me introduce our two panelists. First up is Dr. Marie Homa Palladino. She's a member and fellow of the AAOMC who has practiced in many settings and alongside world-renowned ophthalmologists. Currently, you can find her in Paoli, Pennsylvania, specializing in pediatric myopia management. Marie, welcome to the program. Did I say it correctly? Uh, Paoli. Yeah, you were Paoli. pretty close. That was, that, was, that was good. Yeah, thank you okay. for having me. <laughs> All right, good. We also have Dr. Sheila Morrison. Dr. Morrison is a native of Alberta, Canada. She served as faculty at the University of Houston College of Optometry as a clinical instructor for the Myopia Control Clinic and as chief of the contact lens and cornea clinic at the University Eye Institute. Sheila, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you for having me. I just right. got in from clinic in a myopia appointment actually. So this is a perfect time to get started, I think for the day. Excellent. And I'm Matthew Herzberg. I'm the executive director of the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. I'll be your host and moderator for tonight's panel discussion. All right, so as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to myopia management, the coolest thing in optometry is myopia management. And I'm also always beside myself that more eye care providers aren't lining up in droves to start doing it in their practice. And from what I've observed, most ECPs who are interested are basically asking two things. What do I need and what is it going to cost? So I figured why not bring on two fantastic experts who at one point in time were asking themselves those same questions when they first started out. So let's start with a question of uh, if you want to do myopia management, what is the very first thing you need to do? Maria, I want to start with you. How did you get interested in myopia management? And what do you think is the very first thing you need to do? Well, um, I got started because uh, my children were becoming more and more myopic. Um, I wanted to find out more about this thing called orthokeratology. Um, I went to a symposium, um, met Brian Holden, and... Um, he really gave me the, uh, you know, the impetus to go and, you know, just find out more. And, and it was just something that I, that I had to do. It was just this exciting new thing um, that, you know, just that you must, must do. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, starting out, uh, one, of the, one of the things that, that I was told uh, was just start somewhere. You've got to start somewhere. Um, and, um, that's, that's, that's what yeah. I did. So your family is your best, is your best, uh, starting point. You know, no, some people think, uh, yeah, for sure. I've and, heard that uh, before that family members are often the motivating factor for sure. Right. Right. So, um, you know, my girls were, were my first patients were worth. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. And anyone who ever had met Brian Holder, I mean, was an ex absolute presence in our industry. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, Sheila, same question. How did you get interested in myopia management and what is the first critical step when starting out? I would say my interest stemmed from the academic world. And so, as you mentioned, I started out uh, my career as a teacher and got the chance to work alongside some of our kind of biggest, kind of most um, I guess, earliest researchers in myopia control um, out at Pacific, Pat Caroline and his team have done a lot over the years when looking at orthokeratology and 
all different varieties of myopia management. And then of course, at the University of Houston under Earl Smith, I mean, that institution is just full of researchers looking at all different aspects of uh, you know, treatments for myopia control. And so that's where my interest started. Um, and then of course, just with that, you know, drink the Kool-Aid and once you know and understand the value, and have seen it um, from you know, teaching students um, and really uh, getting a great understanding of the value of it. Then of course now in clinical practice, it's a primary part of our office. Um, you know, getting started, Matt, to answer your question, I think that one of the most important things when getting started in a myopia management practice is to create your vision. So starting with getting a really solid foundation of you know, what is your vision for your office what services are you wanting to offer? You know, what do you believe in and what are you prepared to find education in? Um, that's kind of the starting point. And then from there, it really just grows. So having that core understanding of what your clinic needs to look like, what services are you wanting to offer? What are the you know, values in the clinic that you need to communicate to your staff to get started? I think that's really important. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And and I think an important part of that vision is if you're doing ortho K, like which lens designs should you use? Uh, when I'm when I'm at a conference or working a booth, I get asked a question a lot, which is which lens design should I use? Which uh, lab should I work with? And as the executive director of the AOMC, I basically have to say, hey, you know, there's no one design that works for every patient. So, you know, we can't, you know, we don't recommend one over the other. You should just, you know, go talk to the labs and figure out what best works for you. And recently I found out that's a very frustrating answer to give someone. So, Marie, you've been to Vision by Design's bootcamp for newcomers. You've been in that spot. Um, how, do you, how does one figure out which labs and which designs to start using so people can stop getting upset at me? Yeah, um, it can be very frustrating in the beginning. Um, so I think you really do just need to talk with uh, the different labs and look at their designs and um, look at how uh, they are taking taking your information, what information you need, um, and then you know, and they're designing their um, particular Ortho K retainer. Um, so it's kind of interesting because you get a sense then um, of what makes sense to you. Um, does, does it click? Is it, uh, there's, a, there's a very, very interesting thing that happens when you go from booth to booth to booth. And then you, you really do um, know then that, that, okay, I can deal with this, this certain uh, company and, mm -hmm they're going to help me out and I'm going to learn from them. Um, so I think that would be my, my biggest suggestion is, is, is just, just really find out about the different designs and also talk to the other, um, talk, talk to the other practitioners who mm -hmm. are actually using those designs and just, just, just ask them, you know, Hey, what's your, you know, what's your experience here? And that's the, the beautiful thing about the um, AOMC is that, the, the, the doctors there, the practitioners are, are really willing to talk with you um, about their experiences very honestly and openly. What was your click moment? Like, what was it for when you were looking like, what, what specifically did you, were you looking for? Uh, I was looking for someone who was going to support me in the beginning when I was just first starting out, but also who I could learn from. Um, and take that information and over the years, um, just, just really grow with the designs and have a, a variety of designs. Cause, cause you're right. Not one, um, one design is going to fit every single person. So to be able to grow with the information and to grow with that, that, that company so that you can, um, uh, really expand the amount of, uh, the number of people that you are, um, you know, that you're fitting. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sheila, same question. How did you find the right design or lab that best fits for you? I think you need to also look at um, how do you want to be fitting? You know, are you interested in fitting with more of an empirical style fit? You know, are we looking to have diagnostic sets in the office? Do you, are you the practitioner that likes to place lenses on eye the day of a fit and the day of a consult to kind of 
show patients, I had a conversation that was really interesting actually about scleral lenses with some colleagues in the UK. And it's not something that I do, but on every fit of a scleral lens or an ortho -K lens, they actually perform training that day to assess the ability for these patients to wear the devices. Mm -hmm. And so if that's you in your practice where you're wanting and valuing having, you know, a di full diagnostic set, that's one thing you're going to want to look for would be a design that does have that available. Um, you know, for those that, you know, empirically design everything, I personally am a mix. And so it is, I keep a diagnostic set in the office for those cases where I want to check and see if, you know, the parents really want to find out what is, what is it going to be like before I commit to this? No problem. We can do it. Others, you know, within the exam, it can be a lot of things to do, you know, with all the data collection and conversations in the beginning, that it's a lot simpler for patients and kids to come back for their visit and have a lens empirically designed. So it just comes down to your fitting style. And then just to, you know, agree and build on what Marie just said was, you know, make good friends with your labs. What lab is going to serve you in your practice? You know, what labs do you already do business with and offer you a great price? You know, things like that. Are they close by, have a great, you know, return policy or warranty exchanges that make sense for your office uh, and generally are easy to deal with? My experience is, you know, we're so lucky, you know, in North America that we have so many industry partners that offer that to mm -hmm. us. Um, easy to work with, wonderful labs. And so I think it's just about finding the space that fits for your practice and what style of fitting you're wanting to use for your ortho practice. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, that was exactly my next question. Like, should you leave it to, you know, the lab to start out with? Uh, should you, you know, work with a trial set and, and what point should you start designing your own lenses? And Maria, I think one of the things that you and I had talked about um, earlier on was that, um, what you liked was the ability to grow with the lab and, and, and as you develop, they're there to help you and assist you. And I think that's a, that's an important, that an important, uh, factor in that. Um, I think another, um, another part of that vision of, you know, what you want for your myopia management practice is of course, equipment. And, um, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, as the, the official position of the AAOMC is that a topographer is absolutely essential for doing ortho K. There's a big buzz in our industry right now about measuring for axial length and using an A scan. And so Sheila, we're going to start with you. In your opinion, is there essential equipment you must have to do myopia management? And if so, what do you need? You know, corneal topographer, especially when you're feeding ortho K would be essential, um, I would say. Uh, and axial length really is here to stay. I know we can correlate our refractive error with, you know, um, cycloplegic refraction, and there's lots of ways that we can monitor. But, you know, as time goes on and getting more and more into this over multiple years, um, you know, when it's time and when it's possible, I, especially with ortho K, you know, there's nothing fun about washing kids out to get data and their parents want to know, is there progression? Is there not? Of course, we can measure if there's a change and we need to, you know, adjust their lenses. Um, speak, speaking, you know, just with ortho K, I absolutely recommend and love having axial length. It's another measurement that is considered, you know, becoming more a standard of care. And the cool thing about it is that our industry has really started to take it in their own hands to create tools that are multitasking where we can buy devices now that can do more than just one thing in the practice. So in a contact lens practice, I mean, there's really no reason eventually that we're not all going to be able to have devices available at lower costs. Um, you know, A-Scan is a great place to start. Although, you know, as we learn more about the reliability and repeatability of testing, um, you know, there will have, we are seeing better devices available now that can do more than one thing. Um, and then of course, all of the usual stuff, you know, uh, basic eye exam, slit lamp um, is necessary for contact lenses and um, auto refractor is nice. You know, if you can have one, most offices do. Um, but yeah, I'm curious, Marie, what do you think about, what are your, what are your must haves? If I was on a desert island, and needed my equipment for a myopia practice, I'd say corneal topography. And then axial length would be number two, in addition to all the extra, you know, basic things that we use. Yeah, uh, I, I totally agree with you. Um, so, I mean, I started out um, not having um, any kind of axial length measurement um, years ago. And, and um, just over the years, um, there's been so much that has come out about measuring axial length. And um, so 
so a topographer, a great topographer that you you can work with, that you can understand, and and really knowing your topographer, um, what it can do for you, and the information that you can get from it, is is critical. It's it's really critical. Um, and you know, there's there's no way to to tell if it's working or if it's if it's not working, uh, and to troubleshoot without a topographer. Um, and, and I really do like the axial length. Um, the other thing too with axial length is um, it helps us to look at um, the children who are not yet identified and just, just seeing what the, what the trend, is, trend is. So you can get those children into treatment sooner if you're, you're starting to notice that um, things are, are not going um, as planned. So, um, yeah, right. I think, I think you need, you need to have that. Matt, do we have time for me to build on that a little oh, bit? Oh, definitely. Too? We have Just time you, for you guys to talk about whatever you want. Things. It's so much fun because the ideas <laughs> yes. start bouncing and we mm -hmm. ebb and flow Bile together. Yeah. And so then the next level too, when you, you just really triggered my, you know, mind about the risk factors yeah. too. And that's one thing mm -hmm. that we're learning a lot about. And I, it's a really important part of our practice when dealing with the whole big picture of planting seeds in a, at the right time is we look at axial length in kids that have risk mm -hmm. factors, siblings that are myopic and, you know, an eye that's already longer is at a higher risk. And we can use that to decide even in the beginning, do we need combination therapy right away? You know, is this a 26 millimeter eye mm -hmm. at whatever age, or are they, you know, relatively normal length eye? So not only for the, you know, ortho K progression or making sure that our treatments are working, but the new benefit that we're really, really grabbing onto in our practice is communication early, using it as a diagnostic. Absolutely. And that axial length has become really important for that, knowing more about whatever diopter means with myopic progression and what is that risk and looking at that, you know, the, the again, the, the longer versus shorter eyes when talking to patients about how important it is to get going now on one or two therapies. Yeah. I'm always amazed at, at how little, um, some docs don't talk about myopia management with their existing patient base, like planting those seeds, as you, as you mentioned, uh, Marie, do you have a, a plan in place in your, in your practice for, you know, I mean, it, like it, I've, I've heard myopia management ortho K described as a grind, right? Like you got to have that conversation. If they're not into it, when they come back, you got to do it again. If they're not into it next year. You got to do it again. Do you have a plan in place in your practice for planting the seed, so to speak? Um, yeah, I think we, we, we try and um, plant that seed very, very early um, and just, you know, talk to, talk to the parents and to the children or the, their guardians and, um, and just just kind of see what what's going on. Like you know, are they getting outside? Are they 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 you know getting off the screens? Are they um, you, you know uh, what is their environment like? Um, so it's a little bit more than than just okay. Here's here's your prescription. You can't see in school here. You know, uh, it's it's really from the very beginning, and it, and it also um, incorporates your your staff. You know, your team um, really builds on that, um, and and it, um, it's it's just become basically routine for us now. Um, it's not, you know, it's just something that's that's incorporated into our language at at this point. So you have to also keep your your team um, updated and. Um, give them the information that they need to be able to um, speak with the with the, the patients and um, be, have them come along with you on you know on on this you know every every six months or every every year to to see where they're going. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up staff. Um, you know, I've heard from some uh, optometrists that you know I'd love to do myopia management, but my staff just isn't into it, and I'm like, that sounds nuts. Like. Uh, but I, I think it brings up a very interesting point, which is if your staff isn't on board, then this isn't going to work. Um, and, and both of you have very different practices. Maria, I think you have two, you said you had two and a half employees and Sheila, I think you said you had like 30 or 40, uh, staff like 20, members between any, it depends. It, it again, goes up and down, but mm -hmm. anywhere between 25 and 30 usually. 
Okay. So how, how do you guys incorporate a myopia management program for that many staff members? Do you have a, like a myopia management coordinator? Is that a, is that a must have for a practice or what do you guys I've, think? Al- I've always liked it. You know, I back dating back from to the university of Houston, just looking at the, uh, I guess, evolution of creating a program in a larger space. And it works in smaller spaces too. Although in a smaller space with fewer stuff, you have the luxury of having, you know, your point person is likely you have time to train them. I'm guessing that Maria in your office, those smaller staff members really stick with you and are kind of become knowledgeable in a lot of cross-trained areas and become highly skilled. We have so many different pieces of our practice that are large and spread apart that we have had to kind of start with different levels. So all of our new staff always get training on each of our specialties and every patient, every staff member needs to be able to have the conversation at a basic level because the first interactions with the patients and referrals and, you know, people inquiring with your office are that front line. So we need everybody to talk the language and also they need to understand the basics so they know when to hand off to our clinical coordinators in myopia management. Because again, that first encounter when booking these appointments and setting expectations for what the process is, what all the options are, you know, even screening, you get hyperopic patients looking for myopia control and we'll see them, but we do kind of look at getting them set up for a different type of appointment. Um, And we have what we call um, our myopia clinic. Um, we, We actually have a myopia academy at our office and we have coordinators of that clinic that are a little bit more senior, uh, that have a bit more experience, but, you know, in general, to get everybody on your point, Matt, of, you know, the staff don't want to do it. So we don't have the energy for it. We really try, um, put a lot of infrastructure in and put a lot of energy into teaching the value to our staff and making sure that when we're working with patients, we display passion and excitement and kind of a positive sort of environment so that our staff are bought in. We don't really have an issue with the staff, grumbling about it. Some of our myopia kids are the most fun to work with because some of them are so darn cute and our staff get to know us a lot of them as they grow as well. And we all kind of have fun with it. So yeah, it's not an issue at our office. We do have levels of training though. And I absolutely require on the coordinators to be able to triage and get things set up the way that I want them for when it's go time, when it's consultation time. And when we're looking at, you know, closing, essentially closing the deal on these health decisions, because it's, you know, there's comes a point where we do have to have all the pieces in place to get a patient and their family bought into the idea and committed to the program. Yeah. I love what you said. Uh, Marie, uh, do you agree with Sheila? I mean, how does it work in a two and a half hour or I'm sorry, two and a half person staff uh, practice? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit challenging because, um, you know, there's only, there's only a few of us. So uh, we all really um, play a big part in this, um, of course, my um, my my person who does the billing really talks about you know payment plans and um, you know that part of it. But um, we all really uh, all all of my team are cross trained, um, and they can talk to uh, a patient or a parent who um, has a question about scheduling or how this works or, um, you know, what solutions the, the child needs to, you know, or, or the patient needs. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely, definitely agree with that. You, you in a small office, um, everybody really is involved. Um, and then the other thing that, that Sheila brought up was, um, just the, the, you know, the, the fact of the, the, the buy-in like so once you see the the reaction of the kids and the parents um it's really infectious like it it's great it makes you feel great they feel fantastic um and it's just really really so rewarding um you love seeing them you just you just love seeing them um and it, and it actually becomes a really really fun part part of your day so a lot of my scheduling actually um i, I I put at the end of the day, like after the school uh, school is out, um, I see my my view management patients, um, and I love that part of my day, um, and because the kids come in and they're they're fantastic, you know. Um, if you want to know what's really going on, you, you ask the kids, and they'll tell you. That's awesome. <laughs> so it's great. It's a it's a lot of fun. It's really rewarding. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the time period too, in which you you see those patients too, because um, I think one of the um, the real cost that's not discussed, or at least not discussed enough, is time and effort when it comes to your practice. Because I feel like the modern optometry practice is set up to see patients very quickly, be very efficient. And when you have a myopia management patient, you need to spend more time with them. You need to put in more effort. And, um, you know, it just, like, how do you make that transition from one to the other without putting yourself in the poorhouse? Sheila, what do you think? I used to try to shorten my consults to save chair time. And I've learned that it's actually the most effective in the long run to schedule ample time for your initial meeting. Because if you spend that time with these families, make sure that the kids feel special and the parents have all of their questions answered in the beginning, putting in the infrastructure, then the future is easy because they already understand and they've had all their, they have trust, they, you've spent the time versus trying to catch up and answer questions later or have things kind of, you know, being done without compliance. And so I actually think that it's really important to schedule. I actually schedule 45 minutes for a consult. And to be perfectly honest, sounds like a lot of chair time, but we need it. Um, often during that time, we'll do the, you know, an assessment of cycloplegic refraction as well. So we'll get the drops going and then I'll spend that. And I need that time. And the trade-off is huge because a lot of times, you know, these are, and it's, you know, the best thing for kids to be in myopia management and in myopia control, but as a practice builder, it's, we're, we're absolutely, you know, providing products, you know, ortho K lenses and fittings and all these things are worthwhile as far as the business side of optometry goes. And so putting in the time early um, is really helpful. Now, one thing that I will say that can save some time and also make your time that you do have more efficient is booking in when we schedule appointments for a consult or for an existing patient, if we see them in the clinic, have that early conversation during their routine exam before they come for their consult, we actually have electronic resources that we refer them to. Mm -hmm. So we have families, whenever they book new referrals, they're directed to our website, which is up to date in the myopia management section for our myopia Academy. Um, we also have individualized, um, customized resources that are digital. Now we don't really use paper as much. We like to send it all um, electronically and we can set them up ahead of time to kind of read about everything from credible sources. That's the key is we want to give information that's credible um, and so that they're ready to talk about it. And that helps a lot to have those conversations go really smoothly in the consult visit. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up too. Cause it, I think the, there's an overwhelming, um, I don't know, there, there's that temptation to just blast the patient with as much research as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that when we discussed this previously, you had mentioned that like, you got to be ready for those, those patients that know what they're mm -hmm. talking about. Um, Marie, do you like, how do you gauge, uh, how much information to set on a, a parent, like from the get go? Um, I think I get a sense of what the parent is interested in just from talking with them. And actually from the first interaction that they have with, with, um, whoever answers, answers the phone or answers an email, um, or, or a text message that we get in, um, you, you get a sense of um, where, the, where they're at and what kind of information that they're going to be, re, you know, you're requiring of you and asking of you. Um, we have resources, again, like Sheila said, um, yeah, electronic resources, so, so they can, um, you know, we have a, we, they can go um, to a website, um, we also have the QR codes that they could just scan from, um, from a, 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 a sheet that we give out. Um, we give them, you know, a, a, like pamphlets and um, we have all of the, all of the resources, but then as I'm talking with them, I will actually point out certain things um, because you, you can get guided, you are guided by their questions of what they're most concerned about, whether it be um, infection or whether it be, is this gonna actually work? Or, you know, you know is, is it really going to help my child not only see, but also, you know, what's the, what's the research on, on the myopia control part of it? Um, 
So, you know, you do get a sense of, of that when you, when you do talk with them. And, and, I, t and I also agree with, with Sheila about um, the amount of time it, you're, if, you, if you don't spend enou enough time with them, then they're gonna feel rushed through. Um, and you do lo lose that bond, you do lose that trust. And, and that is really, that first consultation I think is extremely important for um, that relationship because you're gonna have a relationship with, with um, the child and um, you're also gonna have a relationship with, with the parent or guardian uh, for a, a long time. So, so you mm -hmm. have to have that, that communication open. Yeah. And I like what you said. I mean, as far as, uh, and, and this is, I, I, I've met optometrists, orthokeratologists that do this uh, both ways or either or, uh, but I feel like, you know, that consultation isn't just about the consultation. It's also convincing the parent that you are the best, you know, a, you know, option for their kid. Um, and I think a lot of optometrists, uh, especially starting out question whether or not they should charge for that consultation. I've heard some don't, I've heard some do. Sheila, uh, what do you think? Should you charge for your, your consultation? And if so, why? So this is kind of hilarious because we just, I just pulled Canadian optometrist in a lecture. Uh, that's funny you asked that because we put out a question to our, you know, our global group over here in Canada. And I was really surprised to hear that majority of practitioners that we pulled we're not charging a separate consult fee when to me, it seems like it's a no brainer. We have to charge a consult fee. Um, and that goes into the question of, you know, the timing for these, this information to be delivered. You know, are we giving away so much in a routine eye exam and kind of rushing through it and cutting ourselves short of the opportunity to bring them in for a full consultation, you know, just like anything, you know, a glaucoma workup or vision therapy workup, this is taking expertise and time and often special equipment in your office. And so, you know, the consultation, I would encourage y'all to definitely charge consultation fees. And I'm really interested to hear Marie. I know we actually did talk about this question a little bit, and I think you do mm -hmm. the same, right? I do. Yeah, I actually do uh, charge for consultation fees. Um, in the very beginning, I, I did not. Um, and what I found is that that some people, they just they just really didn't value um, the value my time and expertise, mm -hmm. like you were saying. Um, so what we do in our our office is we do charge for the consultation but we tell them if you do go ahead with a treatment modality, no matter what modality it is, um, we are actually going to like credit that towards your treatment. Um, so, so there, 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 there is, there's a level of commitment there. Um, and I tell, I tell the parents, uh, guardians that um, it's a commitment, not only of your money, but also of your time and also of, you know, your, your interest in, in, in doing this. And um, so it's more than just, it, it's more than just monetary. It, it really is. And, and right off the bat, you're going to get some people who, who just are not willing to, um, you know, to do that. And um, that's okay. Like I'm, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. um, because if they're really, really serious about it, um, that small consultation fee um, is is really not going to, you know, make a big difference. Right, right. And I think that's a good lead into fee structure. I mean, obviously, I don't want to mention numbers because I don't want us to get into any kind of trouble. Um, but I think there's a lot of temptation in the beginning to either offer your services at a, a discount, or I've even heard some do it for free. Mm -hmm. Um, or to offer like uh, deals or whatever. Um, uh, Sheila, how do you set up a fee structure and, and, and how do you make sure you get paid properly for your time and explain why that's important? Mm -hmm. You know, in our office, we actually just went back and recalculated. Andrea Lasby has a special interest in our office in that side of actually calculating fee structures. There's quite a few calculators out there, um, some in particular through like the GPLI and some other resources and through, you know, business coaches and things like that to actually use a formula to calculate chair time and expenses. So that's something we certainly have done now. Um, but generally, the way that our fee structure developed, um, 
definitely we split our routine eye exams um, separate from consultations. So there's a fee structure that's for normal routine eye exam and then a separate fee for a consultation. Um, as an example, our consultation fee is an annual fee that's global that covers the measurements that we need. So covers the year of say axial length. Um, and so just looking at how much time that takes and how much chair time is worth in your office for how many staff you have working in the doctor time and things like that um, to kind of look at what you need to charge. We use our consultation fee as a global fee that covers things like axial length throughout the year. And then after that, there's an annual Myopia Academy fee that's actually the exact same every year as the consultation because we want to be able to see them for those extra measurements. And then um, we do recommend, um, and I've had lots of conversations with colleagues all over the place. And generally um, the consensus that has worked well for us is to charge separately for contact lens fitting fees separately for products um, and make sure that you're still charging for those services because again you know you can do bring somebody in for a consultation for the myopia academy or whatever you want to call it in your practice and take that time as covered by those fees and then they need contact lens fitting time and training time with your staff everything that they step foot every footprint of the patient in that office does cost um, the overhead and so that really needs to be considered when looking at your fee structure so that your expenses are covered. And we don't, we can't do anything without our basics being taken care of to afford to have the equipment that we need and offer premier services for patients. We do charge fees and that's how we explain it to our patients that come maybe from outside practices that aren't charging those fees. You know, we just explain, you know, to offer the highest level of care with the technology that we have, we do have to, you know, charge for our services and we never get pushback. It's really usually fine because those patients that are there, you want to weed out the ones that aren't going to be, not weed them out, but allow them to wait until they're ready to be compliant. And charging a fee helps with that. I agree with you, Marie, that you're getting them to be committed a little bit more. I know when I pay for my yoga classes in advance, I'm more likely to show up every single time than get busy one day and not make in, you know, so it's just human nature. And it's a, it's a really important thing to charge for your fees and your time and your expertise. Yeah, that's a great point. Marie, do you agree with uh, Sheila? Or do you guys do it differently in your practice? Is there anything else to consider? Yeah, no, I um, yeah, I, I definitely agree with, with Sheila. Um, we tried to simplify simplify our fees as as much as we could, but we do do a um, uh, an initial um, program fee for a first first time um, ortho K uh, fit. And that is the, the follow-ups um, are a little bit more involved and we might have to exchange out um, an ortho K retainer. Um, so the first, the, the price of the first year is typically um, more than the subsequent years. Cause this, the, the, the years afterwards, it's, it's, really, it's really maintenance. Um, so we really try to, 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 to simplify that um, and the, the same thing with the, with the atropine or our, uh, soft multifocal, um, there are set fees, um, that we change, you know, we, that we charge for the, the program for the entire year. So that's how we do it in, in our office. Um, and if, you know, if it's, if it's paid for, then the parents are like, oh, okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll make it, <laughs> we'll, we'll change around that schedule or, you know, uh, yeah. they, they make it in, um, but they do value it more. If, if, if you do have that, that fee and charge for your services and you, and you have to have that um, otherwise, how, how are you going to stay open? I mean, mm -hmm. and, and you do the, the equipment's expensive and it, and it certainly it's, it's worth it. I mean, mm -hmm. so, so yeah, that's, that's, that's how we do it. So if you have that patient, uh, you know, the parents are just not buying into it year after year. Um, you know, uh, let's, let's go back. Take me, Marie, take me back to when you first started out. I remember you saying like, I devoted one hour every day to myopia management alongside your regular practice. Um, so walk me through, uh, you know, that process of like, you're trying to like, how do you find good candidates? Do you start with your own patients? Do you start fitting your staff? Like, how do you, how do you get your feet wet? Okay. Um, well, like I said before, I, I, I use my own daughters. They're the best guinea um, pigs ever. Yeah. 
<laughs> that's one way to do it. Um, but no, I really did co- go go internally into my own um, patient base um, and really looked at them and, and, and said, okay, you know, who would be a good candidate for this? Who is progression, progressing? Who is someone who, you know, would like to be without um, any kind of glasses and, and, and who would, um, you know, is, is kind of flexible and, and is willing to try something, something new. Um, and you, and you do, you, you, you keep on presenting it to, you know, patient after patient and, and yeah, you're going to be, you're, you're going to be, you know, knocked down a few times, but, um, you have to get that word out, out there. Um, and you have to talk about it. Um, and, and what I did in the beginning was I took an hour out of my schedule, the, the, the very last hour. Um, at first, it was once a week um, just to devote to myopia management. Um, and if I had a patient there, um, uh, then, then fantastic. I was seeing that patient. If I didn't have a patient there, then I would actually do something specific to myopia management in order to have a patient there the next week. Um, so it, it grew from there. So it was, you know, one afternoon, one day a week, then it went to two days and then it went to three days. Now it's all, you know, my afternoons are my, might be a management patients. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's my time devoted, devoted to them. That's awesome. Uh, Sheila, same kind of scenario. I remember when I was working, uh, in my, my father's practice, um, when I would, you know, like when we stopped taking insurance, it was like a ghost town in there. And when he would be working on how to strategize and, and, and take on a myopia management ortho K patient. Um, if, if, if nobody showed up, I was like, so what, so we, are we going to go home early? And he looked at me like I was, was speaking in another language. Uh, my, my mother's his office manager, the two of them would sit there and strategize and learn from what they were doing and figure out how to convert, you know, patients into myopia management patients, a uh, similar, you know, kind of situation for you. If somebody's struggling, should they just like keep grinding? Like what's your advice for that situation? You know, conversion is actually getting easier and easier. The more that we talk about it. And one way that I approach that is. I mean, this, the, I know we buy into this, this group is here. And those of you out there listening to this is because you have interest in this and know the value. And one way when there's, if there's some a family that's still learning and they get that look where you're not sure they're buying in, I often will refer back to the reality that 100% of our colleges of optometry in North America and other institutions around the world have brought this full-time into the curriculum and it is here to stay. Our World Health Organization recognizes it. Our National Optometric Associations recognize it. And it really is a standard of care. And it's our job to make sure that just like any other ocular disease, we're presenting the treatment options. And I'll also go so far as to talk to families that are kind of still thinking it over. And, you know, hey, you know, we, our generation missed the boat a little bit. You know, I have a bit of minus and I know you're a minus six, our generation did miss the boat. That's why it's a new thing to you because this was not something that you had access to at those school age years when your prescription was getting higher. But the good news is today, we do have strategies that have become our standard for how we manage. It's less of an option and more of something that we do recommend to everybody. And rarely do we have, sometimes patients will take some time to come back because they need to organize the cost. But I don't find that's a huge thing. And the more that we just work it in as part of our general care, um, as again, the standard, it's not my idea. This is globally what's going on. And this is happening at all of our schools. New doctors have this in their blood and you know, it's something that's here to stay. That's one technique and one approach or tip that I would say has worked really well for me in communicating value and kind of getting those people on the fence more on board. All right. Very well said. And we're going to end the panel with that. And I want to thank both Dr. Sheila Morrison and Dr. Marie Homa Palladino for joining us for the panel. We're going to turn our cameras off and mute our microphones for the clinical corner, which is coming up now. And I'm going to introduce our two panelists for the clinical corner. 
First off, we have Dr. Leah Johnson, who is one of the industry's top global leaders in myopia management. She works with key opinion leaders and eye care professionals to bring a better understanding of myopia and treatment options that enhance patient outcomes and care. And in 2021, she was recognized by Vision Monday uh, for something most of us already knew. She is one of the most influential women in the optical industry. And we also have Mark Cosgrove, who's considered an expert in the field of orthokeratology by his peers. For 25 years, Mark has trained thousands of ECPs globally on how to achieve success utilizing ortho-K in myopia management and has documented success with some of the most visually challenging patients. Leah and Mark, welcome to the program and take it away. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Matt, for that very nice welcome. Um, Matt, um, before we get started, I'm going to ask if you can disable um, participant screen sharing. Therefore, I can share my screen. Okay, it's done. Yay, wonderful. Thank you. All right, so hi everyone. And as uh, Matt had mentioned, my name is Leah Johnson. I'm the Director of Professional Affairs with Cooper Vision Specialty Eye Care for the Americas. And we are so lucky to have with us today, Mark Cosgrove, our General Manager for GP Specialist. And as Matt had already mentioned, not only does Mark run the entire company of GP Specialist, but he has influenced and designed thousands of lenses for patients' eyes, right, and in orthokeratology. And so he is foremost a technical consultant and a lens designer. He has so much experience. Mark, what's it been, 20 years? 28 years. Leo. 28 years of consulting years. and designing ortho K lenses. And I know, Mark, I was just at Academy last year, uh, last week, and I would hear doctors say, Mark Cosgrove has saved my butt on consultation, you know, for this really tricky patient that I've had. Um, or this really complicated case. Um, and being a practitioner, I know that being in clinic is so much more, you know, there's so many other things going on than designing contact lenses. And so that's where consultation helps support us practitioners, helps us support making parameter changes, um, talking through, maybe we just want a little bit of um, feedback on what we want to do is correct. Um, you know, Mark's always letting us know, letting me know if we can manufacture an extreme design, um, you know, for a complicated patient. So with that, um, and for today's cl clinical corner, we wanted to share with you from GP specialist, what clinical data is going to give you the best outcome for your ortho K patient? And what, you know, data can you provide for your consultant when designing that initial lens and troubleshooting signs and symptoms. And so with that, I'm going to pass it off to Mark to share with you all on the GP specialist ortho K portfolio. Well, Leah, thanks so much for that introduction. I truly appreciate that. Man, you make me sound uh, a little bit more important than I think I am. But, Actually, but thank Mark, you so saved much. my butt as well for yeah. designing some of these tricky IC lenses. Anyways. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, Dr. Morrison mentioned it while she was talking. You mentioned it just now about putting in the time early, getting the right stuff and getting it to a consultant can save so much time on the back end. Um, you might spend a little bit more time up front, but man, it saves time on back the back end. And then Dr. Marie talked about, you know, how you have to have multiple designs, not one lens design is going to work for everyone. And uh, that's kind of what we're trying to build here at Cooper Vision Specialty Eye Care and the GP specialists specifically. Uh, we carry four different lens designs. We have our in-house design. It's the uh, IC Ortho K lens. Um, the IC lens uh, features our new MM1 design. Um, years of designing lenses like Leah was talking about. Um, and working with some of the best minds in this industry have taught me some things that we can do that can uh, maximize that retinal defocus. And so we've incorporated it, that into the IC design and we've made that IC design fully customizable. So if you have a patient who's a minus two and they're 11 years old, but mom's a minus seven, we might wanna maximize that MM1 design for retinal defocus because we know kids head in that way. On the other end, you might have a minus two who's 18 years old and just doesn't want to wear contacts or glasses and doesn't want to have surgery, but he's probably not going to get too much worse. The And mom's a minus two as well. Then you might just use a standard design and not really maximize that retinal defocus because we're not looking to um, control that myopia anymore. Um, 
So that's the IC design. Um, we're the GOB um, manufacturer and distributor in the United States. The GOB has so many different designs, um, high myopic, myopic, presbyopic, hyperopic ortho K lens designs. Um, and it's really a lens design that's built for that practice that really wants to specialize in every patient who walks into the office as being a candidate. Um, we're also the U.S. manufacturing distributor for OrthoTool. OrthoTool is the uh, computer-assisted design software. You use that software to design the lens, and we will help manufacture, we'll manufacture it, and we'll help consult on the back end on those lens designs, but you're designing that lens. And then last is the Paragon CRT, uh, gold standard in this industry. Uh, if you want immediate dis dispensability, that's the lens you'll use. And uh, if you're not Paragon CRT certified, as soon as you get off of this thing, that's the next thing you should do. Um, they have so many resources to help you build your specialty eye care practice. So with that, um, some of the very first data, I guess, starting from the beginning, um, when we are looking at, you know, what data, as Mark mentioned, can help you save a lot of time on the, you know, in troubleshooting later on in the future, I always love to reference, you know, that baseline data. What is that initial lens calculation? And so what's needed from that? And really, Absolutely, we need the first three or first two, let's say auto refraction Ks, a manifest refraction. But once we start adding two and three of corneal diameter, that's going to increase your chances for success so much more. So corneal diameter, we're fitting a gas permeable corneal lens on the cornea. We're reshaping the cornea. So if we design that lens to maximize diameter for the cornea, we're going to get better centration and a better fit for that patient and a better overall outcome. And then the fourth inf um, information is topography. And topography can give you so much information, especially for a consultant, because we're looking at things like axial um, astigmatism or limbus to limbus astigmatism. We can also look at corneal diameter from topography and make some adjustments from that. We can look at eccentricity values. Do we need to change the you know, peripheral edge curves and different things like that? So there's so much information from topography that giving these four pieces of data will really help you succeed for that initial lens calculation. Um, and so when we have that initial lens calculation, you can kind of do it two ways. You can have an empirical lens design. And if you go empirically, you can go to iccalculator.com. And this will help you at least get that first initial lens. Um, the calculator only calculates for spherical lenses at the moment. So you will need to call consultation. And that's when we really want to see, you know, the flat K and the steep K. So knowing that the tericity on the cornea between those two K values is also going to lead us to make a decision if we want to go with a spherical ortho K lens or a toric ortho K lens. Um, anything that you want to add here, Mark? About yeah, I have two cents on that. I'll just give the topography. Um, one and two, they say is all you really need. You need number four. If you really want to do ortho K, you, you need to have a topographer. Um, the topographer tells so much of the story after you fit the lens. So you can design a lens using one and two, but you're doing half the job. That's the truth of the matter. So you should really get a topographer. All right. So yes, from a consultant point of view, topographer, it really gives us a map. Topography is a map and it gives us that map to understand what we're looking at. Yeah. So, um, you know, as we talked about number three, one of the things we need is corneal diameter and how do we select a lens diameter? Mark, um, I see lenses are standard at 10.6 and we can make so many customization and adjustments, but do you want to share with um, our audience and our guests, yes. what's the best way to choose lens diameter? So the best way, you know, you're going to measure the HVID and you want to measure it across if you can. Um, you can't trust what every topographer gives you. Um, if you just tell a topographer to measure it, a lot of times they'll read big. Um, they're going to read from the grayest to the grayest area. You want to read more like at the black area to the black area right before it starts to turn gray. When you're looking at our two pictures here, you can kind of see how where the HVID, the iris diameter starts to fade away into that gray color. That's where you would, 
you know, at that point, that's where you're going to measure from and then measure across. Um, then you're going to subtract 0.5 from there, and that should be your ideal diameter for that lens. I see in this example, we have a diagonal line. Um, most doctors do that diagonal line because it's, you can't see horizontally, it's not in the picture. Uh, it's better to estimate what's not in the picture than to go horizontally. In my opinion, horizontally is going to measure big as well. It always does. So that's just my two cents on that. Um, we typically change the diameter in 0.2 to 0.4 millimeter steps, but we can make it in 0.1 millimeter adjustments. One thing that I would add here as well is, you know, as Mark had mentioned, HVID stands for horizontal visible iris diameter. And um, a lot, you know, and there's so much debate, right? On like, do you measure inner limbus or white to white is what topographies, uh, I know Oculus will give you more of a white to white or biometers give you this white to white measurement. And it's really that though from the scleral, you know, from the beginning of the scleral junction uh, to the other end, and so if you are looking at kind of that, um, and even this measurement here is really looking at white to white. So I would recommend su um, subtracting one millimeter instead of HVID to subtract. Um, HVID is truly kind of from limbus to limbus. Um, so it's going to be a little bit smaller. So you track, subtract half a millimeter. Um, I, from there. Ideally, if you have a fitting set, you put a 10-6 diameter lens on the eye and you take a quick five second video of that five to 10 second video and then send that over with the order and then we know. Uh, or you take it and judge for yourself. Oh, I put a 10 six on and I definitely have room to go 0.4 larger, you know, something like that. You know, Mark, I love the, having the fitting set and just being able to put a 10 six and say, do I have room to go larger? It looks like I can go 0.2 or even 0.4 larger. And then we're not getting into this debate on, you know, where we're measuring. Um, so yes, having a trial set, we have an IC 30 lens trial set that we also, um, that you can use and you can, they're all in minus threes, but you can put that on the patient. Definitely. Just like that. Go back one real quickly. You see, we put a lens onto the eye there at the end of that slide. And that's about the size the lens should look on the cornea. Yeah, we're looking for about, I would say 95, 90 to 95% of the cornea, just where it's not over the limbus, just inside the limbus. Yep. Um, and that's gonna give us the maximum efficacy for the IC lens. So the I'm next gonna take thing. this one, Leah. I want to take this one. This all right, all right. So going back to topography. So getting a topographer isn't the only thing. Once you get it, you got to know how to use it. Um, we have three topographies here, and these are topographies that were sent to us um, from doctors to design lenses. Now, looking at this first topography, there's no chance that you're going to get a lens fit correctly. It's, you know... The readings aren't going to be right. You can't measure an HVID. You can't tell if there's astigmatism. You got that blue leaking in, which it shouldn't be there. Nobody really has that on their cornea unless they've had trauma. Um, the middle one's decent, but the eye's half open. Uh, you really want to get that open. And then that third one, that's what you want a topography to look like. The Myers are clear. It, you get the whole picture, the whole spectrum. That's what one, that's what you want it to look like. Leah? I really don't have anything else to say. Just that remember that if you have a placido-based topographer, it is dependent on the tear film quality. It is actually measuring the reflection from the tear film off, um, off the placido-based rings. And so you want to have a good tear film quality. So a tip here is to use artificial tears. Um, you know, don't douse the eye with artificial tears too, because then that's going to create lots of pooling, you know, but have, you know, put a tear in, wait maybe a minute and then take the, if you're having trouble, um, obtaining a good sample. Always look at the Myers. We don't really have a picture here, but also if you take off the color map, you can interpret to look at, um, and we'll show you actually in the next one, um, you know, to look at the Meyer quality to see if you have good quality of topography. 
Um, so quickly, just to order your IC lens, right? You have the four pieces of data. You have your topography, you have your auto refractor um, case, you have your refraction, and you have corneal diameter. Um, how do you order an IC lens? And as I mentioned, you can either go with an empirical or the diagnostic fitting set. You can either choose your first parameter online as we have a calculator. And if you know exactly what lens you want to order, let's say you have a pretty simple spherical patient um, and that IC calculator tells you exactly Exactly what you need, you can actually go right here to our website at GPS orders at coopervisionsec.com. You can just send an email with your account, you know, account number and let us know what you want to order. But if you need support in calculating the lens or making those lens adjustments, um, email us at a separate email gps consult at coopervisionsec.com and please you know you can attach the topography files and and to give us these initial baseline data for choosing your first ic lens so once you've cho chosen the correct lens and you put it on the eye number one thing is centration uh, lens has to center um, you want that lens centered on the eye, you wanna remove the lid, open the lids really big and see where that lens centers. Um, even in our picture here, we have the lid touching a little bit on the, on the upper part of that um, lens. You really want it, no lid interaction to see where that lens sits. And later in this presentation, I'll show you exactly why in a video we have. Um, your ideal fluorescing pattern is a three to four millimeter treatment zone. You want a bullseye pattern. Um, Again, beware of lid interaction uh, and decent edge lift. You want to have that, you know, just at the edge of that lens, you want to have about a millimeter to two millimeters of lift off so we get good tear exchange. And then you also want to have a little bit of lens movement. One to two millimeters of lens movement is uh, very good and you don't want it just sitting stuck on the eye. Um, you want that lens to move around. So what do we look at for our first, you know, one, our initial IC dispense? The first thing we're looking at is centration and edge lift, as Mark mentioned. We also want to check that refraction over the lens. The patient should be able to see 2020 through their lenses. Um, and then you want to have insertion and removal training to make sure that the patient can, you know, put the lenses in at night and that they can also take them off in the morning. And so why it's really important to have this insertion and removal training is because when we have the patients come in for the very first morning, right, you want to schedule that first morning appointment, um, then we want the patients to remove the lenses in the morning and to not wear them um, coming into the office. Office. And this may seem contrary from other lenses, um, but I see lenses work so fast that if the patient wears them into the office that morning while they're looking down, mostly, you know, these are children on their iPhones or on their digital devices. And so it can actually remold the cornea um, while they're looking down on the way to the office. And then you're also going to be troubleshooting, wondering why is there induced cell and there's going to be other issues there. Um, that you'll be spending your life. Yeah you'll have a little bit of lens decentration, things like that, that could be induced just by wearing the lens during waking hours. Uh, one other quick thing I wanted to just mention, you look at this picture we have, and that's of an IC lens, and most ortho-K lenses, you're gonna look at that and say, oh wait, we're way too steep in that reverse curve. We ain't sending that patient home with that lens. That's gonna be tight. Um, with an IC lens, with the GOV lens, with an ortho tool lens, some of the more advanced designs, send the patient home, and check that out the following morning. Most days, as the cornea reshapes, the cells start to move, they'll fill in that area, those bubbles will disperse and go away. One other trick is if you have some bubbles during insertion, close the lid, tap on the lid, and a lot of the times the bubbles, air bubbles will disperse that way as well. So going back to, oh, you know, so once we have, um, you know, our one day follow up, what are we going to do here? Um, you know, you, we have the IC lens dispense. We said we scheduled them for the first morning. They removed the lens in the morning. So now what are they going to do? Um, so we want to check, you know, for their, what they're going to come in, they're not going to wear their lenses. So you want to check the uncorrected visual acuity. You expect about 50% or more myopia correction. Um, and you want to just, you know, gauge what's that post wear refraction. You know, is there any induced cell? What, what else is going on. Um, but for the most part, for the uncorrected visual acuity, I'm not worrying about it on day one because this is only one day. We, we wanna see you know, them for a one week follow-up as well. You wanna to take topography to check for any lens decentration with the eyelid is closed. 
you want to look at ocular health evaluation. Check for that ocular surface integrity. We want to make sure there's no staining. Um, on the very first night of wear, there can be very light staining, central um, and light staining on the cornea, and that is seen in about 40% of patients. If it's very light staining, it's okay, but if we're seeing like dense coalesced staining, then that means that the lens is touching on the cornea, and so we are worried, right? We don't want to um, open up the cornea for any you know, um, any harm. And so we want to then make sure that we change anything that is, if there's dense coalesced staining. And then lastly, have the patients put the lens back on for that fitting evaluation. And as Mark said, you know, we want to check this lens centration and movement again with a dynamic fluorescing video. Um, so if you can send a consultant a video, that is amazing. That is going to give you so much more data than just a stagnant picture. You know, it could be when the patient blinks or where that lens is sitting. And as Mark mentioned, you know, we would like to see, you know, that lens, the lens is always going to have that lid interaction but it's really helpful for a consultant to see what the lens looks like without that interaction. And so going into here, here's the video. I'll let um, Mark share with you. This was one of his patients uh, the other day. And so, that's, yeah, where, you can, okay. that's where dynamic floor stain pattern comes in handy. So you can see with the lid closed, it looks like this is a low writing lens and it's not centered well. So if we, both of them, this one too, you have, this one's more of a smiley face. The lid is pushing on the top of the lens. It's causing some lift off and giving you that bubble. And then when you remove the lid, you're gonna watch that that bubble slowly starts to go 360 when there's no lid interaction at all. You'll watch it. See, we still got touch on the upper lid. You can see that the lid is pushing that lid watch. down. Now that lens went right up into place. That bubble was starting to go away. Then the lid comes back down into play again. Um, so that's a perfect example of why a video is better than a stagnant picture. Because if we go back to the start of this video, you would see that the right lens looks like it's writing way low. And if you just sent me that video without a topography and without anything else, we would remake that lens and make changes based off of that. But then watching the video, as soon as the lid comes out of play, that lens goes right up into position. And then just to reiterate, um, when you see this bubble here, uh, the first time that I saw this on one of my IC patients, I remember telling Mark, right, sending him an email saying, hey, we need to lower that reverse curve. It's too steep. And it, the patient was a higher myope. And, you know, the next day that actually patient went from a minus 550 to a minus 50. And that bubble, there was no longer a bubble. So the fluid had gone out to that reverse curve and filled, filled it in. So talking about quality imaging, you know, we want dynamic fluorescein pattern and as we mentioned, reliable topography. So this is where I was showing you the example of, you know, here we see that we have perhaps a central island in this topography and we're not really sure what we're looking at. And then when we look and when we take out the color map, right, from the topography and you actually look at the quality of the Myers, you can see here, I hope you can appreciate that the Myers are distorted and there is an eyelash that has also been photographed in the way. And so once again, just kind of bringing these things to um, your attention that, you know, sometimes you can have these false red herrings. Um, and so actually, um, you know, we had to retake this topography. Here's another picture of just very distorted, a distorted topography. If you see this, um, you know, it depends on that tear film quality. So we'll want to retake that topography. Um, so don't make changes too quickly, Mark. Yes, definitely. Um, back to, you know, the last slide. If you see some bubbles in the reverse zone, don't panic. Um, you know, if you see that, don't, don't immediately think, oh, we got, we have to change and lower that return zone. That's not always the case. Um, you know, let that lens get its weekend. If it's centered, um, let's see what it does in a week. Um, if at one day you don't have uh, SPK or staining or anything like that, let that patient wear that lens for a week and then see what happens. Um, that's just what we do and what we recommend. I think that's the best route to go. If you make a change at day one based on a lens being riding too low or bubbles in the reverse curve, and then at one week you have other issues because we made changes. Now we don't know as consultants, is it because we made those changes too early and we didn't let the lens do what it's supposed to do? 
And a lot of times we chase our tails and we end up going back to that original design. The only thing I want to say here is please do let us consultants know and adjust it. We do need to adjust if there's a dense central epithelial defect. You know, maintaining ocular health and integrity is so important for these patients. And the biggest reason we get that is uh, lens size. We fit a lens that's too small on the cornea. Uh, we don't get an HVID from the doctor. They don't send a topography. It's K's and RX and says, good luck fit in the lens and then we fit it from there and you make a 10-6 diameter because that's what's standard and the 10-6 diameter is just too small and you end up pounding down on that central cornea and causing some epithelial defects. Uh, so if you put the lens on and right away see that the lens is too small, that's another time that I would probably immediately make a change. Great, so rate of myopia correction in IC, these lenses work very fast. Um, Mark, what's your experience in, in IC correction? Standard uh, is normally two to three days we get full correction. Uh, we go into a lot of offices and we'll do trainings and I'll see two diopters change in 45 minutes. We'll go and put a lens on a patient, sit that patient in the chair. That's the first thing we do on the, the visit put the lens on the patient, sit them in the chair, and then we train the doctor while the patient's sitting there with their eyes closed. 45 minutes later, we recheck check that patient, and sometimes they've changed two, three diopters. That's a great fitting tip. If you're, if you're in your office, put some trial lenses on a patient and go see your next patient, and then come back and see them and show them the change. Set your foropter where it was before, and then they'll look through and say, oh, I can't see. And you say, oh, good, because that's where you were 45 minutes ago. Look at the change we've made in 45 minutes. Imagine if you wear them overnight. Then you, that's a great selling point. You get them in it. And after that first night, um, I get it all the time. The wow factor, Leah's seen it. Uh, Dr. Homa Palladino, I, I fit with her so many times uh, that that first night will change four or five diopters and they'll call me up and go, I can't believe what just happened last night. Um, and that happens a lot with the IC lens, with the GOV lens, those two lens designs, especially because I get the most feedback from them as well, but they just work very fast. Very cool. Yeah. So with low myopes, you tend to get correction in that first day or two. And then with higher myopes, it does take a little bit longer to achieve that full correction. So, you know, don't make changes too quickly. As Mark said, give it some time. Um, one thing that's kind of a controversial topic is, you know, what if you have a higher myope, Mark's smiling because we were debating this earlier, and you have a higher myope and, you know, you went from a minus five, let's say now to a minus one, and that patient is a minus one that day. Um, what do you do for their uncorrected visual acuity? Um, there's a couple of different options. People have different feelings that one, you shouldn't wear, um, contact lenses 24 hours, right? You wore it during the sleeping hours. So now your eyes should be exposed to allow for oxygen during the day. Um, so for some of those patients, you know, you would suggest for them to wear a weaker, older pair of glasses if necessary. Um, I know Mark and I also experience other doctors who will dispense a, you know, a minus one single uh, daily, you know, single use daily disposable contact lens that they can just use for that day to get them through. And then by that second and third day, they're going to be seeing a lot clearer. Yeah. Some of the best minds in the industry don't agree with that. And, um, and, and then others do. So it's a, it's a debate that's up for, you know, for topic. You get to decide as a practitioner, yeah. you get to decide yeah. how you Services. want to manage your patient. So these are kind of the two different options that practitioners um, can have to manage that uncorrected visual acuity until it reaches um, full correction. Another tip that I heard um, from someone was to see your patients on Friday for that initial dispense, see them on Saturday for that one day follow up by Sunday, you know, they're getting a little more treatment and on Monday they're able to go to school and function and see clearly. Um, and so that's kind of that cycle that they'll have and so they don't have to need as functional vision on that Saturday and Sunday as they're going through the treatment. Great tip Leah. 
All right. So recommended follow up, you know, we want to check at that what after the one day follow up, we want to check out one week, one month and quarterly for these children. We always want to check ocular health, their daytime vision, lens fitting, lens condition. So at every visit, have them bring their lenses so you can check for compliance, you know, ask them open ended questions. How are you handling your lenses? How are you taking care of them? You can actually see the quality of the lenses. And this last point, I'll leave it for Mark because it's his favorite? Take a topography at every visit. Um, lens centration, it comes back to that 10-6 diameter on a 11-6 cornea. At one week, it might center very well. At one month, it starts to go a little bit off center. By three months, it could be sitting over here on the side of their eye because it's just gone off center as it's corrected the cornea. Another thing is with higher myopes, as you flatten that cornea, that lens sometimes tends to tighten up and drop down, and you're going to have to loosen it and bring it up a little bit. So um, those things don't happen at one week. It's usually at the quarterly visit. So that's why I take a topography every time they come in. So with that, thank you, everyone. I know we went 16 minutes overboard, um, but we had a lot to share with you on, you know, what good data you and clinical data you can share with us as consultants. Um, so. Anyways, we, thank you. Here's we both our, like to talk too. So we have we have a lot of we've been. I I was helping out with uh, GP specialist and I see consultations for the past you know past six months. So we both have a lot of insights to share. Um, and lastly, before I turn it over to Matt, just want to let everyone know that we do have another GP specialist. Um, webinar coming up next week and it's building your myopia management practice this you can scan this qr code to sign up and this is actually a webinar for your staff and office team members so this one isn't a webinar geared for practitioners but it's to educate the staff on myopia management and this will be given by dr matthew martin um, november 17th at 5 p.m so yes please scan the qr code to sign up and with that matt i'll give it back to you Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you both. Wow. I learned so much every time you guys are on. Thank you so much for doing the clinical corner. All right. Well, that's it for this episode of the knowns and unknowns of myopia management and other cool stuff in optometry. And if you want to watch this webinar again, we'll be posting the a video on our uh, AAOMC YouTube channel. You can find a link for that by going over to the AAOMC website, aaomc.org. And I'd like to thank Dr. Sheila Morrison, Dr. Marie Homa Palladino, Dr. Leah Johnson, and of course, I want to thank Mark Cosgrove. And I'd also like to thank GP specialists and Contamac for their support of this program. And for all of our listeners and viewers around the world, thank you for your attention, and we'll see you at the next one.